chapter 10. <coughs> Jesus said, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, nothing secret that will not be become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated, and uh, we'll sing our sermon hymn now. His eye is on the sparrow. <laughs>
probably wondering why I lit the uh, Christ candle today. Uh, you're going to have to wait till the end of the sermon to find out. <laughs> now, dear hearers of the word, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I learned something the other day, and it's not because I saw a lion in the woods. The physical and bodily reactions to fear and excitement are indistinguishable. There's no difference. If you saw this lion in the zoo, and this happened to me, here you probably remembers this. Uh, we were at the Como Zoo, and there's a lion in there just kind of laying down. I didn't see the other one that wasn't laying down. I'm just kind of looking at the glass, and all of a sudden, I heard this, this roar through the glass. And it just, how is he doing that? And I looked, and there's the other lion just, just roaring for his food or something. And it kind of just, I wasn't expecting it. I, I was excited just because I knew that he was behind the glass. Now, you can be excited to see a lion in the zoo. Uh, it's pretty cool. If you've never seen one before, I go and see it. They're really cool, especially if they roar. But if you saw one in the wild, if you're in Africa on a safari and, and you got lost from the group and, and you heard that or saw that face to face, uh, your body reacts the same. It would be quite a different thing than if you saw him behind the zoo. Can't tell the difference. Your body doesn't know the difference between excitement and fear. There's just no difference. I like to read about uh, uh, airplanes and pilots, and I, I really like the airplanes of World War II because uh, their their engines, their planes that that a person you could still fly planes similar to that. You know, the piston engines. You know, the new ones with jets are just so expensive you just never even have a chance. But it's conceivable that a person could fly a plane with two engines. Uh, and so I'd like to read about those types of things. Uh, this is a B-25 Mitchell. And it is said that during World War II, the Army would not put pilots in planes like this. This is a low-level bomber uh, troop support plane. They flew during the Normandy invasion and the D-Day, uh, treetop level. I mean, they were, they were, you can see them fly as high as just the peak of this church right here. That's how high they were, above the ground. And, uh, and the pilots talk about seeing, you know, the enemy troops looking right at them and pointing their rifles and, and guns at them. And it was very exciting. And the, and the Army uh, would only put people under 22 years old in those planes. Why? They're not smart enough to know better. That's exactly right. They were young. So, oh, I'm never going to die. Yeah, I'll go and fly. And the guys that were 22, 23 years old, they're like, I can do that. Are you crazy? They're guys shooting at me. I did that for a couple of months. I could do it again. In fact, the D Day, the invasion, the, the, the transport pilots, the, uh, it's the, uh, the DC 3 plane that you kind of see once in a while, there's a tail dragger. Uh, they called that a C-47, a cargo 47. Same plane, different number. And those were the, old, the older pilots that a lot of the cargo runs. There, 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 there's no armament on the machine guns, but there tend to be older pilots. And during the invasion, when the flak started shooting, what did they do? We're getting out of here. <laughs> and they, 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 they dropped, the guy said, okay, time to go. Push the, they pushed the green light, and paratroopers said, oh, okay, they jump out. They were short. They were short of their drop zone because Pilots said, we're getting out of here. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. They knew the difference. There's excitement and there's fear and there's there's wisdom in knowing the difference. <laughs> What's going on in our gospel today? Jesus talks a lot about fear. Three times he talks about it. Before Jesus, last, last Sunday we had Jesus at the end of the gospel saying to them, go. Make disciples of all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to you. Go. 
teaching them all that I have commanded you. And I'm with you always. Okay, that's the last thing Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, earlier in the Gospel, today, before he said to go and make disciples, he had commissioned the 12 disciples. He, he's getting them ready to go out as <coughs> ambassadors for himself, uh, to be on a mission on their own. A mission in which they will, again, they'll exercise great authority, but they'll also have to demonstrate what it means to have profound trust in God. They have the power, they have the ability to do things in Jesus' name, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to proclaim the message in and out of season, even when people don't want to hear it. But what does it mean to trust? He said, don't take any money or bread or bag or sandals extra. Uh, depend on the grace of God to, to carry you through it. Uh, if you enter a house and they receive you, great. If not, go to the next one. Don't linger and wring your hands and wonder, hmm, how come they didn't like me? What, what, maybe I need to say it a little differently. No time to waste. But today, as uh, part of what seems to be kind of a... Uh, Pep talk, you know, a pre a pregame. Come on, get ready here. Jesus comes down and levels with them, tells them uh, the exact truth. He tells them exactly what's going, what they're going to face, the challenges, uh, the struggles, including rejection, uh, slander, persecution, and even death. Now, the gospel writer Matthew is writing uh, about Jesus, right? We know that. Good news of Jesus according to the Gospel of Matthew. It traces his history all the way back to the Old Testament to the present, what Jesus is doing, what he's about. It's a story of, of the origins of Jesus and his ministry, but it's also a story written for his hearers, his, his congregation, the people that are disciples that he's that he's kind of in charge of. It's like, it's like Matthew's a, he's a disciple, he's writing a history of what he knows, but he's also writing it for encouragement for the people that are with him then, at, at the moment. It's, it's for the people that are experiencing being a disciple of Jesus and having people slander them and make fun of them. First thing that, that we notice is that fear, in many ways, is uh, the opposite of faith. And not surprisingly, therefore, in seeking to encourage his disciples, Jesus says what the prophets of old have said, what angels have said, <laughs> what uh, the priests of the Old Testament and the, and, the, and the worship have said over the many, many times they've said it. Do not fear. Whenever a message comes, uh, and I think about it, uh, at Christmas time, we, we read it from the Gospel of Luke, and the heavenly host of God show up and the angels are excited and, oh, great, God's army. <laughs> the heavenly host of God, wonderful, great. I can't wait to see more. Is that what they say? They talk, they're scared to death because as shepherds, they know they haven't been exactly the best people on earth. And when God shows up, the wrath of God comes. First words out of the angel's mouth, do not fear. Do not fear. When uh, Joseph was uh, found out Mary's pregnant, he knows he's not the father, and what is he going to do? Well. If I expose her to and show and tell, tell everyone that she's been unfaithful to me as my betrothed, uh, they could kill her. And they probably would kill her because it's a shame on the village that one of their own did this. They, they would stone her to death. Uh, I'll, I'll divorce her quietly. No one will need to know about it. I'll do it. Angel comes to him and says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your own. The child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And guess what, Joseph? You're going to name him Jesus, for he will, he's going to save his people from their sins. Do not be afraid, Joseph. Do not be afraid. And he listened. 
the shepherds listened. And after they left, they, they went to the manger with great joy. Do not fear. Do not fear. Jesus warns them of coming persecutions. He says, you know what? You're my disciples. Uh, a servant is, is no greater than a master. You know? They, they persecuted me. If they, they call me Beelzebub, the, the prince of demons, you know, lord of the flies, what do you think they're going to call you? You're my disciples. So, number one, let's get that straight. <laughs> but he, encour he encourages them. This is what's expected. But do not fear about that. In my first parish I, I, uh, in Alexander, North Dakota, back in 1991, I met uh, John. Uh, John Wilson. He's a contractor, up built houses and stuff. And uh, he was a member of the church. and. Uh, he said something to me that, that stuck with me ever since. I'll never forget it. Now, what was it he said? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, he said, you know, I suppose, uh, I suppose uh, being a pastor is like being the, being the mayor or the town, town chief of police or the town cop. You know, there's always somebody that doesn't like what you're doing. There's always somebody that's going to gripe about it. You know, but, you know, it's not, it's not personal. It's just, it's just the way it is, isn't it? And this is my first parish, and I, I have not experienced any issues yet. And I kind of thought, okay, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> it's not personal. And I think he served on the city council before, so that's what I, you know, it's, it's, it's in the office that you hold. It's, it's what you do. And you think about it, you know, every decision a mayor makes or, or the chief of police or, or the fire department chief makes, there's always somebody that's going to say, why did he do that? How come this, not this? Uh, Jesus says the same thing. You, because you're a disciple of me, it, it's, it's really not about you at all. It's not against you at all. It's just because you're my disciple, you're a follower of me, there's going to be opposition. It's simple. It's as simple as that. In fact, the, the Gospel of John, the writer of John, John <laughs> uh, he says, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it, but it's going to try. In fact, there's people who, in this world who would rather walk in darkness and they'll try to put out the light of Christ because they like it dark. And we can ask, well, why? Why would somebody want to walk in the dark? Who knows? Uh, evil likes secrecy. Sin likes to stay hidden. That's why Jesus says, when you hear a whisper, proclaim it. Don't be afraid. Tell the truth. Speak the word. And uh, don't be afraid. But it's the way it is. As disciples, there are those who are going to say, you shouldn't be doing that. And again, it's not about you, it's who you represent, Jesus. Do not fear, he said. Do not fear. There's always going to be opposition. The second thing he talks about, don't be afraid, is he says, don't be afraid of people who can kill you. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound like it makes sense. It's the disconnect. Don't be afraid of people can kill you. Well, they can kill me. Isn't that the worst thing in the world? Or is it, is it the worst thing in the world? Jesus says, no, it's not the worst thing in the world. Don't fear those who can kill the body and leave the soul alone. Fear those who can do both, kill the body and the soul, and send them both to hell. That's who you need to fear. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This is what he has to say about this in, this in this discipleship book. Human beings should not be feared. They cannot do much to the disciples of Jesus. Their power stops with the disciples' physical death. The disciples are to overcome fear of death with fear of God. Disciples are in danger not from human judgment, but from God's judgment. Not from the decay of their bodies, but from the eternal decay of their bodies and souls. Anyone who is still afraid of people is not afraid of God. Anyone who fears God is no longer afraid of people. Daily reminders of this statement are valuable for preachers of the gospel. Now, just so you know, uh, in May of 1945, right before uh, the the, the, the 
the prisoner camp in Flossenburg was liberated from the Allied forces. In May, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung. He was a conspirator uh, of trying to uh, get Hitler assassinated. And they, they, they traced every, every known connection to it. They, they were killed, arrested and killed. The power stops with the power of death stops with the disciples' physical death. He, he, he knew that. And Jesus knew that. Don't be afraid. Life is more than this life. There's more to this life than this life. And besides, uh, look at the birds of the air. Look at the sparrows. Aren't, they're sold for two for a penny, right? <laughs> Yet, and not, not a sparrow will fall, and that can either mean die, but it also means, the fall means the, the way they flit and fl fly around, you know, like sparrows, the way, they, the way they fly. God knows exactly what they're doing. I mean, not one falls to the ground without my father's knowledge. You're more valuable than, than many sparrows. Now, somebody can say, well, that's not a whole lot. They're two for a penny. Well, many, well, I'm, I'm worth five cents. Is that all I'm worth? That's not the point. He, he says, God knows what's going on. He knows what you're going through. He is watching you in a good way. Uh, we sang this song. This lady who wrote it, 1905. Uh, or in 1905, her and her husband were visiting in a, in a place called Elmira, New York. And this is, this is what she has to say about it. We, con we, con we con contracted a deep friendship uh, for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle, true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for nigh 20 years. So, in the bed, 20 years, bedridden. Her husband had, was an incurable cripple who had to propel himself to and from his business in a wheelchair. Despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day while we were visiting with the Doolittles, my husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked them for the secret of it. Mrs. Doolittle's reply was simple. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith gripped the hearts and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and I. The hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow, was the outcome of that experience. God knows what's going on. Jesus tells us ahead of time what's going to happen, but God knows what's going on. A third, Jesus aims at the heart of one of the most paralyzing fears out there. It's especially uh, paralyzing in families, uh, communities, and and congregations. Sven went to the psychiatrist. <clears throat> he said, Doc, I got to talk to you about my brother, Oli. I said, Well, what's wrong? Shouldn't I be talking to him? He says, Well, that's the problem, Doc. He thinks he's a chicken, a hen. He clucks around the house, he pecks at the carpet, he puts nests in the corner with the couch cushions. I mean, Doc, we. We gotta do something. Doctor says this. Oli, or Sven, Oli is, what he's got is, a, is psychosis. It is treatable. It's gonna take some time, but, but these, these things can be fixed. He can be cured. He will be back to normal. No more chicken. Sven said, well, that, that, that sounds great, Doc, but, but I gotta tell you. We really need the eggs. <laughs> Fear of conflict. What are we going to do about that? We've got to do something, yeah, but let's not, let's not upset the apple cart. We can get so afraid of that, so afraid of conflict, whether within our own families, you know, brother, sister, parent, right there, or extended family, or even the family of faith in a congregation or a community. We can be so afraid of that 
that our witness as disciples is covered up, you know? We, we put a, a shade over the light, a dark one. <laughs> because we're afraid of any uh, upsetness, you know? Well, let's not rock the boat. Uh, Matthew's original hearers were people who were thrown out of their families for being disciples of Jesus. When Jesus healed the man born blind, uh, the Gospel writer John tells it this way. Uh, when the parents uh, were asked, is this your son? Did, did, did Jesus, this man, Jesus, heal him? They said, uh, the parents say, well, uh, this, yes, this is our son, but we refuse to really comment on um, whether he was healed or not. John, the author, writes this commentary on that. The reason the parents spoke this way is because the leaders of the synagogues said, they decided, if anyone confesses Jesus as Lord, anyone like who does that, they're kicked out of the synagogue. So the parents are like, you know, ask him, he's, he's old enough to ask for himself, we'll just, we'll just stay out of it. You know, even the parents of this man, they raised their whole life, uh, are, were afraid. I mean, was, that was the threat, a very, very real threat. And Matthew's congregation had members who were kicked out of their homes, out of the synagogues, gone. They, they weren't allowed back in because they were followers of Jesus. Sometimes, and I've done it myself, I, have al I allow my faith in Jesus, uh, the plans that I know he wants me to do, the, the things that he wants me to do, I, I, they're held hostage by what people might think. Well, what if people don't like this? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we all do it. We've all done it. I don't know if I want to say anything. Read the Dear Abby advice. It's always about stuff like that. What should I say about this, this trouble that's going on? I, he's my brother-in-law. <coughs> she's my sister-in-law. I, I want to maintain that friendship, but I have to tell him what's right. And I, but I'm afraid it might ruin it. Oftentimes they say, well, it, it, should, it probably will. But you've got to tell them the truth. Struggle. No matter what it is, the fear of conflict. Jesus reminds us there are worse situations than conflict. <laughs> conflict is not the worst thing. It's, it's often the fact that nobody does anything about it. That makes it worse. In order to make evil triumph, all that good men need to do is what? Nothing. Jesus knew that a long time ago. I lit that candle, let your light shine before others. The Christ candle we light for baptisms. And uh, you'd think that a baptism is pretty, pretty safe in the congregation, right? We say, let your light shine, I give a candle. Uh, within this simple act of, of remembrance and initiation, and worship is a reminder, a clear call. We are witnesses as, as Christians. And being a witness, bearing the light, has a profound consequences. It can result in conflict within our families, uh, within uh, our communities, in, in the world. Those who shout, against violence, against destruction, like the prophet Jeremiah in our first reading, find themselves at the, on, the, uh, on the, the bad end. <laughs> I'm just speaking the word. Lord, they're, they're mad at me because I'm, I'm speaking your word. Or they're quietly ignored or openly ridiculed. Uh, some want to bring their faith from Sunday to Monday, actually. <clears throat> they want their faith and work and life to be consistent, what they do during the week with consistent what they do on Sunday. Imagine that. And, and they're hurt by it, or by other people, co-workers, people make fun of them. Or they say, it's not Sunday, keep that to yourself. And some across the world are losing their lives for it because they're Christian. There's no question about it. 
the candle that we light, the candle that we use in baptisms, and, and uh, the Christ candle that we light after Easter is a reminder of the pillar of fire that uh, led the people of Israel at night. It uh, reminds us of the Pentecost flame that we read about and worshipped a couple weeks ago here. How the Spirit chased the disciples out of Jerusalem, got them out in the world, and continues to, to chase us and, 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 and carry us with the Spirit's power throughout the world. Question is, is, it, is that candle too hot? Is it too hot to handle? Too hot to touch? Well, in some cases it may be. Where God's light must penetrate, uh, the intensity <coughs> must be there. It must be hot. But Jesus again reminds